Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, calm our hearts and our minds so that we may focus on you, that we may hear your voice for what you have to say to us through your word. Strengthen my words, for mine are empty, and you have the very words of life. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be holy and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, when I worked for the seminary where I attended, I was the assistant to the academic dean. And one of those, the jobs that I held several times a year was to help the faculty get robed. Because frankly, these are a bit of a pain to put on and some parts of what you need to correct and you can't actually reach once you've put this thing on. You put hoods on that flow down here and you're trying to reach and it's just easier if someone puts it on you. And of course, the, the, I came to understand as I worked with the faculty that the, the robes have certain meanings. There are, are, uh, there's a lot of symbolism that comes with these robes. Some of it has to do with what's on the arm, how the arm is cut, what material it's made out of, what colors are on the hood as it goes around. They all give indications of academic attainment what level has this person completed in terms of academic rank? Bachelor's degree, even high school has their own cut of robes. Master's degree has its own long, uh, long uh, cuffs that go down. Like I said, they show academic attainment, but what do they show in terms of spiritual life? What do they show in terms of spiritual attainment? As I was uh, uh, helping the faculty robe and they looked like a great assemblage of peacocks, <laughs> what could this tell me about their spiritual life? It told me a great deal about their academic life. And indeed, even my robes can tell you something of my academic life and my, acad uh, my academic attainment, but what does it tell you about my spiritual life? What is it that we wear that, that tells us about our spiritual life and our spiritual health? Where do we find that? Of course, it's not going to be in the long, flowy robes that tangle and trip and are really for a fair amount of looks. But Jesus highlights this issue in today's text in Mark as we continue our march through Mark as he gives two examples, two contrasting examples of discipleship. 
Now, of course, Jesus, as we've been going along, Mark here has been having confrontations with spiritual leaders as he entered Jerusalem. He came into Jerusalem in that triumphal entry that we celebrate on Palm Sunday, and I believe, if I remember correctly, we celebrated right before Advent, which was a kind of a weird uh, a, a feeling to be celebrating Palm Sunday right before Advent, uh, where we were in the text. But he comes into Jerusalem and he has this series of confrontations with the religious leaders because, of course, they're trying to trap him. They're trying to trip him up. And so they confront him in the temple courts on a number of things. And this begins back in chapter 11 of Mark. We're now bordering on chapter 13. And this began all the way back in chapter 11, verse 27. They've been trying to trap him unsuccessfully, and of course, with one exception. There was a scribe who came not to trap him. There was a scribe that came to honestly have an engagement about the scriptures. But now that all of these exchanges with the religious elite are coming to an end, Jesus is going to make something of a summary statement here. He's going to give this compare and contrast like a good English teacher on a written exam. However, we need to see that this section is really a two-part section, but needs to be held together as one. And so let me, so often our Bibles will divide it up, even my Bible here, the New International Version, will divide up this, this encounter or this, uh, this statement about the scribes, and they'll divide it with a different heading about the widow giving her offering. But if you have your own Bible there, if, even if, perhaps if you have your pew Bible there and a pencil, circle 38 through 44 and make a note that these two need to be read together. It's a two-part statement here. These things go together. These two belong together. Jesus isn't simply going to give us a negative example. He isn't going to make, simply make a pronouncement about the religious establishment. He's making a statement about discipleship, and he's going to give us a positive example as well. If we think back to the beginning of Mark when we talked about Jesus' first statement, repent for the kingdom of God has come drawn near. Repentance involves two things. It involves turning from something and turning to something else. And so Jesus here gives us a very concrete example of it. He's going to show us what to turn from and what to turn to. But what is it that Jesus is saying in the first part of these two parts? Well, Jesus is going to highlight the false discipleship as exemplified by some scribes. And, when, and I want to note here, take a minute to note, that the way that Jesus phrases this, he is not speaking against all scribes. He's talking about a certain set of scribes that exhibit a certain set of behaviors. Scribes, of course, were the experts in the law. They were the religious teachers of their day. The version we read, the NIV, says it this way. He uh, he's, uh, reads this way, excuse me. Watch out for the teachers of the law, period. They like to walk around in flowing robes. However, that's not quite correct. Our pew Bibles talk about the scribes, comma, who like to walk around in flowing robes. Even that comma is a little bit misleading right there, if you'll bear with my grammar for a second. The way that I think that this should read, the way that we can understand it best, comes from the not-so-King James Version that I translated. Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long flowing robes. Beware of the scribes, the, the ones that like to walk around in long flowing ro robes, the ones who like to have the head seat at the banquets, who like to sit in the place of honor at the synagogues. He's not talking about all the scribes, but the ones who like these 
things. Because they show some contrary behaviors. They show some problems in their faith, in their discipleship. He notes that they like to walk around in long, flowing robes. They like to show themselves that they belong to a very specific office. Again, I, 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 working in academia, it was very, very funny because one of the things that, that the faculty of Gordon-Conwell is very set in doing is making sure that when they have an academic procession, that when they are all lined up, they are in rank and tenure order. So when the, the faculty come in, it is the distinguished faculty emeriti, and then the faculty emeriti, and then the distinguished faculty with the longest tenure down to the lowest tenure, then the full professors, longest tenure to the shortest tenure, to the associate professors with the longest tenure to the, I'm running out, of, I'm gonna end up here if I keep going on. You get the idea. There's a certain rank and file to everything, and they like to have those in order. And one of the professors once commented to me, when I was at Wheaton, we simply went alpha order. Imagine that. Their robes, the scribes' robes, showed that they had a specific religious office. They had a certain rank and a certain distinguishedness. They like to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. That is, they like to hear their honorific titles. They like to hear master or rabbi or father, as sometimes people will, as clergy will be called by Catholics. They like to hear those things. I remember very specifically after I had, um, after I had been hired and was the dean's assistant, one of, and I don't want to say distinguished in a job title sense, but one of the most distinguished faculty at Gordon-Conwell was uh, the man that I took Hebrew from, Gary Pratico. He was the New Englander's New, uh, New Englander. He would climb Mount Katahdin in wingtips. He always came to class with a vest and a tie and a coat, had the most perfect posture and the most gentle, respectful manner of anyone I have ever met. He's one of those people that when you walk into their presence, you just know that you're in the presence of one of those saints of God, given a, a, just a specific, a, a special grace to all who he encountered. I remember sitting in my office, uh, one of the first times I encountered, her, encountered Gary as a staff member. I knew him as my professor, and so when he walked in, I said, Good morning, Dr. Pratico. And very calmly, Dr. Pratico, Gary, oh mercy. <laughs> you could have knocked me over with a feather. Call me Gary. The title, Dr. Pratico, the formality was not something he was willing to stand on. Proud to call Gary, a brother in Christ, someone who not only told, taught me Hebrew, but taught me to love Hebrew, which is not easy. But he didn't stand on the title. He didn't insist on doctor. He insisted on Gary. Jesus says further about these scribes that they, they like to have the most important seats in the synagogue. They, they, they like to sit in the honorific seats that shows them to be wise and learned and, well, a little bit above other people. They love to have the place of honor at banquets. Of course, banquets in those days were a bit of the cultural element. The, they were more frequent than they are now. And of course, the place of honor would get the best food and would get to be served best. It's like being at the wedding reception where you try to figure out, now which table are they going to call first for the buffet line? Because I know that's the freshest food. And we all know that when the chicken has been in the tray for 45 minutes, it gets a little dry. And so these are the people that seek out the place of honor at the banquets to be seen as someone special and to get the best food 
and the best drink. But they insist on these things. They want these things. They want these honors and these titles and these, these shows of their academic and cultural attainment. But then they turn around and Jesus says, they devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. Despite all these shows of their religious piety and of their rank and of their status, Jesus says they, they turn around and they, they steal from the very people that they were called to protect. Time and time again we see in the Scripture, as Brett read in the Deuteronomy Scripture, that God has a special concern for the poor, for the widows, for the fatherless, for the most vulnerable in society, and over and over and over again tells his people, take care of them. And yet, here are the religious elite stealing from the very people they are, they are to protect. And they make lengthy prayers for show. They obnoxiously long prayers even. Prayers that go on and you think, does he have a thesaurus up there with him? I'm not even sure half of what he prayed about, but somehow it sounds good. But on that point, we need to make sure that, uh, make, uh, to be careful that, to understand that Jesus is not speaking up against a few things in this passage. First of all, he's not speaking against all religious teachers or religious people in general. He makes care to, to say that these are some of the scribes. These are the scribes who like the showy things and then turn around and steal from the ones there to protect. These aren't the, the religious people who have a, a devout faith in God and sh that comes out in their everyday life. These are the people who use it for show. And so religious people are not who Jesus is talking about here. He's not speaking about, of course, about messing up in faith. That would be a problem for all of us. He's not saying that we can't mess up, that we can't fail in our faith, but he says it's something entirely different when we are deliberate about breaking God's commands. When you can see plainly in the scripture that I have commanded this and you have decided not to. That's where we run into to problems. The problem isn't hypocrisy because, of course, if we're honest, we're all a bit of a hypocrite, aren't we? We had an entire series for Lent on that where our faith doesn't match, where our actions don't ma match up to our faith. We recognize that we're all hypocrites that we all fall short of the glory of God. The problem is when we choose to claim his name and choose to disobey him intentionally over and over. And Jesus, despite what you might be hoping here and praying even in very, very short prayers, he is not speaking against long prayers blanketly. What Jesus is speaking against is long prayers for show, ones where you do run to the thesaurus and think, I'm going to nail this one. People are going to be happy with this prayer. Because the reality is, as a community, if we come together once a week to worship and glorify God and put our community petitions together, and it doesn't take some time, if we're not interested in spending some time with God, that's a problem too. But if our prayer is for show, so that we can show how wonderful we are and how, what a great relationship with God we have, that's a problem. But when we earnestly seek God and enjoy spending time talking to God, that's not a problem. When we come together during the, the, the pastoral prayer and we spend some time petitioning and praying to God and thanking God, that will take some time. 
And we should love to talk to God, but not for show. Jesus uses these self-serving, self-promoting scribes as an example of false discipleship. And I said that that Jesus isn't just going to leave us with a negative example. He's going to turn around and give us a positive example as well. So what is that positive example? Well, Jesus goes to the temple where all the offerings were collected. They had a particular area in the temple where all the offerings were collected, and they had 13 different horn-shaped receptacles, kind of trumpet-shaped receptacles that people would put their money into as they would come in. And of course, being like almost like a change box, when you put the money in and it was metal coins, it would make a noise. And very naturally, if you had a lot of money to put in, if you've ever used one of those change sorting machines because you've saved up in a mason jar or larger for the past five years and you think, I'm not sorting this myself, and you pour all that jar in, it makes a great deal of noise. Now, if you're sorting 10 pennies, that's not going to make as much of a noise. And so when the wealthy would come in, because of our wonderful sinful nature, some people would come in and make sure that those coins fell as loudly as possible. See how wealthy I am and see how much I am giving to the church. And when someone poor came in and dropped into those receptacles, that was obvious as well. Because the noise would quiet down. And so Jesus is sitting across from these receptacles watching the people and a poor widow comes in and she throws in two copper coins against all these who are giving so much. And Jesus highlights the value of her gift and the faith of the giver not the wealth of the giver. In fact, he says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more to the treasury than all the others. So often we think this is actually what the coins look like. There are two copper coins here called lepta, and we get an idea uh, of how much they're worth. They're worth a quadrant. It's right there in the scripture. You all know what a quadrant is, right? No, of course not. Uh, What it comes out to be is uh, part of a day's wages We like to think of it as two pennies, but it's not really two pennies. It's probably more like this, somewhere between this and this, somewhere between a dollar and two. This is is a, a meal off the McDonald's value menu, or Wendy's, whatever you prefer. But that's approximately the value of the woman's gift. It's 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 a meal. Sometimes when we think of this as two pennies, we think of it as a gift that's so insignificant that, of course, why not just throw it in? But this gift had some value. This was the gift. This was the value of a meal. This was the next day's bread. And here the woman comes in, and she gives her next meal to God. If this is all I have today to feed myself and it goes into the treasury, then what a value to God. He explains, Jesus explains that this gift shows the woman's faith. It's a total faith. It's a faith in God's provision. That just as we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we trust that God will give us this day our daily bread. We trust that it shows the woman's faith, faith that she trusts that God will care for her as he has promised in his scriptures over and over. And it shows the woman's faith that all things are God's and all things will return to God. That is faith. That is a loud clang from two copper coins. And so this faith that the woman exhibits 
that she demonstrates in her giving of the two copper coins. This is the positive example that Jesus gives. This is the mark of true discipleship that Jesus wants to highlight. The text is primarily, this passage is primarily about discipleship and secondarily about stewardship. We find here that, that in a small, in a sense, it doesn't matter what goes into the offering plate. Some people are going, oh, yes. But it is a show of our faith in God. It's, it's not the amount that counts, but the value to God. What matters first and foremost is our faith in God. True discipleship isn't going to care about the outward appearance of our faith, whether that's our giving or our service to others or which worship service we attend. It rests on God first and foremost. And so we can ask God, where is it, Lord, that you are calling me to serve? What are you calling me to give? What are you, how are you calling me to worship? How can I give my best to you? It's funny because we think we have to figure that sort of information out on our own, but God calls us into that conversation with him. It means as well that we read our Bibles not so that when the pastor says that he's quoting from hes second hesitations, that we go, second hesitations, I, I need to look that one up. And then go around and quote second hesitations to others. Well, my pastor said it. But we read so that, we read because in the pages of Scripture we see God's love towards us, God's grace and God's mercy, and we desire to see more and more and grow more and more like Christ. That's more than just memorizing trivia. That's a desire to see God's love. Our actions are a thermometer to our faith. Showing whether we have a vibrant, hot faith that is boiling over or whether we have a cold, barren faith. This is something to pray about. Why is it that we serve God and obey or not obey God's commands? Do we do it out of duty or do we do it out of habit or do we do it because we love God and we have a desire to put God first and foremost? To trust deeply even when it doesn't seem prudent even when it seems that we are giving up our last meal, that we trust God and trust God's provision. Discipleship and stewardship are marked by trust in and service to God, not self-service or self-promotion. What are our actions saying about our faith? How are we called to serve God? Are we being faithful to God's call in our lives? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have given us not just a negative example of discipleship, but you have pointed us to this woman whose faith trusted you against everything. Help us to learn from her faith and to respond likewise. Seal this word in our hearts that we may apply it to our lives. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen.